Welcome again to your small groups this week. This week we are going to be discussing the book of Job and the story of Job in the Bible. Just a little background for you before you jump into this text, which you've already heard it, so maybe I should have given it to you before, but here it is now. The book of Job is meant to be a wisdom book. It's not supposed to be a literal interpretation of a man's life. It was written to help people understand a theodicy, how God works in the world, how God works out evil problems, how God works out problems, how God is active in the world. The Odysseys are challenging. They are the way in which we answer the tough questions of life. And in particular, Job is one of those challenging places. The passage we read today is a wisdom text, part of that, that gives us a sense of where God is in the world, where the writer of Job believed God exists in the world. And the interesting part about the very end of that, when it says the fear of God, is that we interpret, interpret that as fear. The fear we know shuts us down, makes us unsure, makes us afraid. The fear we know, the word we use for fear is different than what the gospel or the scripture writers would have wanted for the word fear. What they were looking for in the Hebrew was something closer to awe. The word awesome we overused in our world. And it sense that something is beyond our understanding. Fear is a lot different than that. Fear has a sense of cowering to it. And awe should too, but it's a different kind of cowering. It's a cowering with a sense of what possibility might be next. So what's interesting about Job is you experience him losing everything and um, the potential that he might not stay faithful to God and that his friends encourage him not to be faithful to God or to be faithful because he did something wrong. And they're trying to navigate this with him. And what the writer of the scripture is trying to say in this passage right here is wisdom is right where it belongs, in God's hands and with God. And then Jesus seems to echo what that means later on when he reminds us that God's love is like a mustard seed, that God's faith in us is small but mighty. So that's what we're trying to remember in this passage today. That God's love through all of this is going to give us that sense of connection to God no matter what we've experienced, no matter what pain we've experienced, no matter what loss we've experienced, no matter what good things we've experienced. Now there is another theodicy out there and, and it's in, fairly common in Christianity in America especially. It's called the prosperity gospel. And in the prosperity gospel, the idea is that if I do this many good things, I will get this much in return from God. It's an exchange system, really. Televangelists have made their life on this. They have made their life on this because what they've done and what they do is they get you to engage a little bit into it and then they have you send them some money and then when you start seeing some good things happen in your life, you think it has to do with what God's doing, not what the televangelist might be trying to make you think about, or maybe what is just happening naturally that is good in your life. And they'll say that if you're finding yourself down and out without money or anything, that it has to do with the fact that you've lost God's favor somehow. Now, televangelists have done this, but there's also small church communities that do this too, that don't have a lot of money, but that keep people believing that somehow the reason they aren't able to get out of poverty or loss or suffering is because they've done something to offend God. That is the opposite of what John Wesley invited us into in our faith. John Wesley believed that God's grace was there before we even knew it. That God would work in our lives if we could recognize that grace to help us grow in that faith so that we might grow to the place where we would be in peace and perfection in connection to what God is doing in the world. Take, for example, the picture of this pumpkin. This pumpkin has been growing in our garden, has been out in the elements, has nowhere to go, and yet is beautiful. And it is growing large, and supposedly from the folks in our garden, it's going to be huge. 
Now there's a part at the end of the book of Jonah where Jonah sits under a tree that God then withers and he complains about it. Same wisdom that comes in Job as well. Who are you to complain when things don't work? And the other should be said, who are you to praise when things seem to go really right for you but wrong for another? And then there's Jesus' invitation in all of this. God's love is there for you no matter what. God's gifts are given to you so that you can use them for God's purposes in the world. So that you can make lives better. So that systems can be changed. So that forgiveness can happen. And so that we might have a world in which all have enough. Which no one is left behind. This is the dream of Jesus. This is the dream that God offers us through Jesus. And the book of Job becomes a part of that wisdom. It becomes a reminder that God is supposed to be something we are in awe of. Not fearing, but a sense that God is going to take us to the next possibility. Even if suffering and death is what we've experienced, God will still find ways to offer us life. It might be not be the life the world offers us or that we expect, but that God is in each of those steps. This is grace. That pumpkin in the garden hasn't been protected by anybody. It hasn't had anything, and yet it is beautiful for what it is. Does it itself complain because it hasn't been protected or sheltered all year long? Does it itself have problems with that? The invitation of Job is to recognize the gifts we have, to appreciate what we have in each moment, and to be in awe of the possibility of what might be next. In hard times, that's really hard to do. And that's why Job is seen to be striving for that consistently. To trust in the goodness of God's love in the world is a hard thing. And the reason we follow Christ is because he followed God's love all the way to the cross. So you may ask, what does this have to do with the pumpkin? Not a lot. It's just a pretty pumpkin in our garden, but it reminds us that God even cares about that pumpkin. God cares about you. God cares about the poor person you saw on the street and the rich person you saw driving around in the Tesla. And God will help us find a way to God's kingdom if we can just listen to God and be holy. Not so that we get wealth abundant, but so that God's wealth abundantly might be shared with all. Go in the peace of Christ this week, friends, as you discuss. And remember that you're going to be taking part in a ritual of coming in here and um, taking a piece of cloth and making it a part of your conversation and your time together today about what God is doing in your life. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen.